gang, welcome back. We've made it to two thirds of the semester. It's time for our Mechanics of Materials exam number two. There's only three in the whole semester, so we're two thirds of the way there. What I'm gonna do today is give you kind of a review about what is most likely to show up on your exam number two, okay? So the last exam stopped with, oh, uh, PL over AE, right? Axial elongation plus um, thermal elongation, okay? So this is the last thing we had covered on the last test. So we're starting this test with chapter five, which is on torsion, okay? So here we go. Chapter five, torsion, okay? What do we remember? What do we see? What did we learn in these chapters? What are we gonna have on the test? What do you think? What do you think? Here's what I think you have. You got torsion generated shear stress, right? Which we remember was TC over J, okay? We have to remember that J is pi on two C to the fourth. Well, that's not even that. C outer to the fourth, right? This was for solid J equals pi over two C outer to the fourth minus C inner to the fourth for hollow round shafts. Big mistake here is thinking it's pi over four, but that's I for round shafts, not J. So don't get those two backwards because that's a, an easy thing to do, isn't it? Okay. What else did we have in the this chapter? Oh, a fancy way to find T, torque, right? Remember this guy. P equals T omega, right? Power equals torque times angular velocity. And remember, angular velocity has to be in radians per second. A common way that you'll get that is in uh, RPMs. But we know don't use RPMs. Use radians per second. We can convert that pretty easily, though. So an RPM is a rev per minute, right? Times get rid of minutes by doing 60 seconds and, and, and get rid of revs by doing rev on the bottom, right? One rev is two pi radians, right? Wah, wah. And so two pi divided by 60 changes me from RPMs to radians per second, okay? So you've got to convert every, every time you use omega to radians per second, okay? Remember that. What a, now, so usually what do we do? This is a fancy way to have to go back and find T for torque so I can come back and use him up there, right? That's generally when we get that kind of thing. What else did we have in this chapter? How about this? Statically indeterminate problems, okay? And what do we use to do those? We use this guy. Phi equals not the angel of twist, but the angle of twist, which is T L over J G. Okay. And we had that problem. Remember, we worked a problem kind of like this. It had two gears attached to a wall over here, right? And we knew there was a gear ratio, and this one could move so far, which meant that that one had to move the same but in a, in a two to one gear ratio or whatever, and it had to move the opposite direction and go back and review that problem. Really good kind of test question for you, okay? So shear stress due to torque, power equation, and then the angle of twist, okay? So that's about all I can think of from the torsion chapter, okay? Then the next chapter was Chapter six, okay, which is beam bending, okay? One of the real pivotal chapters in the book, one of the most important things, okay? Because in beam bending, we got, we got to meet somebody new down here. Well, number one, we had this guy, okay? Here's a beam, okay? And I don't know, there's a roller over there. A distributed load, a 
concentrated load and maybe a moment, a burrito force, right? So on this kind of problem, you'd have to start off with this and that would generate, okay, a shear moment diagram. Now this should be a review from statics, but we taught it again in solids like you've never seen it before and there it is, but we know how to do it, right? And from this, I would be able to generate a maximum V shear force and a maximum M bending moment. And maybe I give you this, that the cross section of this beam is a T, okay? The cross section of that beam is a T. So what do I have to find there? I gotta find where's the neutral axis. I gotta find that, right? Then I gotta calculate I. Um, I've got one side in compression one side in tension, right? So I could ask you all kinds of questions about that. Now the kind of questions that I'm gonna ask you are, go are going to revolve around that main equation from chapter six, which is this guy. Okay, MC over I. What was that equation called, do you remember? The flexure formula. Okay, and I might be able to ask you something like, what, for this, for the given beam, with that cross section, find the maximum compressive stress on the beam. You'd be like, what? Okay, so step one, I gotta find the V diagram, I gotta find the M diagram, so I can find out where does the maximum moment occur and how big is it. That's that number, right? And then I gotta find the neutral axis and I gotta find C, which is the distance from the neutral axis to the outer fibers. And if it bends downwards, the top of the beam is gonna be compressive and the bottom is gonna be in tension, right? So then I would use this value here for C, and then I have to calculate I, 112 BH cubed special there, right? Okay? So I could ask you, I could give you one beam and I could ask you a lot of questions about that beam from this chapter, okay? Now another thing that was in this chapter that's a little bit tricky was composite beams, okay? Do you remember composite beams? We had like a beam that was, I think we did this one, that was steel on the top and aluminum on the bottom. And you might say to yourself, self, Who's gonna put an aluminum beam and a steel beam? I don't know. It could happen, right? It could happen, I don't know. We've gotta convert one of those materials into the other one, and we did that by using the, fa uh, the factor of N, which was based on the modulus of elasticity, okay? So the modulus of elasticity of material two divided by the material modulus of elasticity of material one. And students often ask me, well, which one do you use? Uh, which one goes where? Which material goes where? And here's the way I do it. I always put the strongest material uh, on the top. And that way, N is always a number bigger than one. And I think to myself, okay, in this case, the steel is, let's say I get N equals, let's just for making up numbers, 2.3. N is 2.3. Then I'm saying to myself, okay, N or uh, steel is 2.3 times stronger than aluminum, right? So if I want to turn the aluminum into steel, I don't need as much of it, so I'm just going to take that aluminum dimension and divide it by 2.3, right? Go back and review those problems if you're confused. The one thing you got to remember about those is at the end of that problem, if I'm checking the stress for aluminum, if I divided to convert it to steel, when I get to the end and I find the stress in the aluminum, I've got to unconvert it. I got to multiply, right? I got it by the same number. So if I divide going in, I got to multiply going out. If I multiply going in, I got to divide going out, okay? So don't forget about that for those composite beams. A lot of stuff in chapter six, but this is the biggie for chapter six, right there, okay? MC over I. Shear moment divers. You're probably going to have to draw a shear moment diagram for this chapter. Guaranteed, right? Okay. Next chapter. Chapter 7, which was 
transverse shear. Oh, Lord. Transverse shear. I think possibly the hardest chapter in the book, okay? Transverse shear. We learned that transverse shear was tau equals V Q over I T. We had nine kinds of trouble determining what the heck is Q, okay? Go back and review those videos for finding out what in the world do I put down there for Q, okay? That's super confusing for students, okay? Transverse shear, okay? Um, and then we also had uh, little Q, right? Was force divided by spacing. Remember those built-up beam problems where we had nails ever so often, and how do we find out what the spacing of the nails were? That's the equation we use for that. Or Q equals what? That's the Vicky equation, VQ over I. Okay? And both of these things we use for calculating little Q, which is shear flow. Okay? I think one of the most confusing parts uh, of solids or, or mechanics of materials. What the heck is Q? It's so confusing. Okay, and that was for, we use this primarily for those built up members, okay? Built up members, all right. Now, that's chapter seven. Finally, the last thing that I think is on there it's just the very, very, very first part of chapter eight. And that is thin walled pressure vessels. Okay. Remember how we check for thin walled pressure vessels? It's the radius divided by the thickness. And if that number is greater than 10, then it's a thin walled pressure vessel. Uh, we had two equations. We had sigma equals PR over T, and we had sigma equals PR over 2T, right? And this first one we called what? Hoop stress. And the second one we called longitudinal stress. Okay? And that's all that I'm going to put on, uh, well, I would be putting on chapter eight is just up to the, the hoop stress. The rest of it, which is combined loading, we'll save that for the next exam, okay? But this is plenty of material to cover. So chapter five, boom, down to here, whoop, whoop, whoop. Chapter six, chapter seven, and the first part of chapter eight, okay? So I think that's enough. So what are we going to do? Follow me on the series here. I'm going to make you about four or five, probably five, uh, exam two practice questions that are going to be practicing you on these techniques here, okay? Now, it's, it's exam time. Be sure you don't just watch the videos because I can kind of make it look easy for you. So push pause and work it with me. See if you can work it. Skip to the end. See if you got the same answer I did. If you can't, then maybe back up and see where we went wrong. Maybe I went wrong. Hopefully, hopefully not. But it's possible. Okay, so there you go. I hope this helps you get ready for exam two. Let's study hard. Let's make 100. I'll see you on the next video.